chair of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Will it be Tim Hogan? It's going to be Christopher DeMary at the line. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this special presentation of the 11th round of the Pro Mazda Championship in the waning week of this season and on this build as we get ready for potentially a really big build release on the I Racing service. It is me, myself, and I for this broadcast here. So I'll be working the cameras and the solo voice on the microphone here today. 24 cars have themselves set and ready to go. Racing 23 have put in a lot of time. We're about 15 seconds away from the starting grid, getting itself sorted out, and then we will bring you that. Star Mazdas on this track here at Sebring should put on a good, a good show, a lot of drag, a lot of downforce, and this is a very bumpy, very slick racetrack with a lot of high-speed sectors. Should be some good opportunities for passing for the, all of these drivers here today. But first, let's go down your starting grid here at Sebring. David Jarvis ends up on pole position over Angus Waddell with Julianne Dunn and Scott McIntyre on row number two. Row three looks like Ollie Peacock and David Dendelo with Everett Paddock and Max Bartolotta on row number four. Row five, Flavio Satrino and Francisco Fioroni with John McCall Noyon and Anne Medima on row number six. Row seven, we're going to have Andre Cini and Harley Lewis with the likes of Vincenzo Chardetti and Craig Ridley going back to row number eight. Row nine, Martin Arnoldis and Michael Stanley with Ben Schubert and Dane Nezik on row 10. Row 11, Marco Caruso and Marcin Andula with Hayden Gober and Carl Crowley making up this 24 car field. It's gonna be a really quick race here today. 14 laps is what we have on the docket. So things are gonna go relatively quickly here, just waiting for all the cars to get themselves gridded up so we can get ready to go racing here at Sebring. Of course, this track most well known 
for the 12 hours of Sebring. Other big event it pretty much hosts. Really doesn't have too many. Indy cars do test here, and they often put on a good show. Of course, the World Championship Grand Prix Series has a stop through here on the iRacing side of things. But in real life, it's pretty much just the 12 hour. Would love to see some stock cars go around this place, and of course, see some Indy cars run around this place as well. As we're just waiting for the last couple cars to get themselves set up on the grid. Waiting, I believe, on Angus Waddell and a Scott McIntyre. I believe McIntyre just got himself sorted as well as Angus. So now we should be getting the field more or less set to go. Should be hearing those revs pop up. You hear them shift into gear. Lights are on. Revs build. And we are away. Good start there from your pole center of David Jarvis on the run down in towards turn number one. It's a very bumpy grid here. That may make things difficult for some of these guys through turn one for the first time. Very high speed, a lot of downforce cars really gonna be working through here. And this is gonna be when you have the most dirty air of this entire race. Moves being made down. Now in towards turn three, you see the four car of Julian Dude comfortably getting himself into that third spot as the entire field will be getting themselves single file here through this sort of second sector as they run now down through Big Ben on, on the run down in towards the hairpin. This is going to be the first point where David Jarvis and company really need to worry about passing opportunities. No one's going for it. The four of Julian Dunn looks down the inside for a moment but doesn't end up going for it. You're going to probably see a bit of side by side in the background as it is very easy to make some mistakes through that hairpin for the first time. Down now, through and in towards turn number seven. A little bit wide there for your race leader, not quite what you want to have typically, but everyone's working themselves through nice and cleanly here. Don't think we've had any incidents on this opening lap. We're gonna look back a little bit though. You might see some cars with some damage maybe some front wings. I don't see much though. I see a lot of clean race cars at the moment. We do have a TNT car though off in the background. Not sure who that is. I believe that is the seventh car of Martin Arnoldis. Let's see what happened to him going in through tower corner. Very difficult corner here. And we need to rewind the cameras back a little bit further. There was actually a little contact there through that right hander. So this incident may have started a little bit earlier, but in towards tower. Very bumpy entry, and there's actually a surface change through the apex of the corner. I think he pretty much just overdrove it. May have gotten those left side tires on the grass as well as David Jarvis and go. Come off turn 17 and down the front straightaway. And you can see the slipstream has been working. No one has been able to run away from anybody. And they're going to fan out three wide for the opening of lap number two on the run in towards turn one for your race lead. Up the middle goes that number four car of Julian Dude. Not going to quite get it done. But they're going to say three wide. And we got one car who goes off. But the bulk of our field and keeps the way clean. Oh, big incident for the two who outbreaks themselves there into turn one. We got another car off and around. Not sure who that is. We basically just need to get a replay of the last minute of what your leaders have been up to. So let's take a peek. This is the rundown onto the back straightaway where you're going to have all the slipstreaming really taking place. And as these cars run down in towards turn 17, you're going to see defensive goes to two of David Jarvis, the one of Angus Waddell. He's going to pull out alongside at some point, probably does it through this corner. You see a couple bumps for your race leader. He doesn't quite get the exit off that corner he needs to. And this is when the fighting starts for all of these guys down this front straightaway. You're going to see the move three wide for the race lead across the line at the end of the opening lap. And then through turn number one, big check up there from the one car, tries to slot it down the inside, does a good job of it. Not exactly sure what caught that yellow car out. I think he may have had a little bit of contact, but you did see a couple of cars end up going wide on the racetrack. And it's gonna be Angus Waddell who currently leads. David Jarvis, has been a terrible lap from him. He has slotted his way way back into about fourth or fifth position as they get ready to come down the front straightaway. Once again, you see Angus doing everything he can, trying to break that slipstream. A couple cars going through the DRS sign there in the background on the closing lap here of lap number two, excuse me, the closing of lap number two. And through turn 17, the field's gonna go. Angus has done a good job being able to run away from the field. Second is Julian Dunn. Ollie Peacock has slotted his way in towards third. And they get ready to come across your start finish. Actually, I take that back. It's Ollie Peacock in second, Julian Dunn in third. 
Max Bortolota in fourth and in fifth spot. Flavio Saturino as they come across start finish and in towards turn number one. See a couple cars pushing wide again. We got one car in the wall on the exit of turn one. Who is that? Big, big damage to that car. We did not manage to see who that was after the incident, but I did see that car in the wall. Gonna rewind the cameras just to see if we can figure out who that might have been. I believe they would have been running about 10. So let's see what we can find as these guys all were going down in towards turn one. And there he is. John and Michael Noyan is who it was. Get a look on board with him for this incident. See exactly what happened to him as they work through, as he worked through this final corner. You see the way the car trying to deal with the bumps as he works his way through. And in towards turn one, I think it may have been just one of those bumps that actually ended up catching him out. And then to turn one, he gets really, really tight. The back end steps out. You see him counter steer and the front tires just catch. Not much you can really do in that situation. And unfortunately, the tricky track here at Sebring caught him out. They said it was gonna be a quick race. These guys are doing under two minute lap times here at Sebring. Well, a little bit quicker than GTE cars typically get around this place. Of course, they don't have nearly the high, the top speed that those cars have, but they are so much quicker in the corner. You see the two car in the background, bit of damage. That was your one point, your pole sitter. And at one point race leader, David Jarvis, he's gonna be going backwards with all of that aerodynamic drag on the car. Let's see what happens to the nine though. Max Bartolotta who comes off of sunset and the run down in towards turn one. The four of Julian Dune might just make a move in towards turn one. Has a slipstream, but no. Gonna keep it single file as they roar through turn number one for the fourth time of 14 laps. Got one car wide. Very, very easy mistake here at Sebring. It's easy to get yourself a lot of understeer going through that corner and to push yourself a little bit wide through this sort of second segment of the racetrack now though. These guys worked their way down Big Ben once again. It's been a very great, good lap. Uh, last couple laps, really, from Angus Worrell. Race lead out to 1.4 seconds over Ollie Peacock for the one car. And this is exactly what you want here at Sebring with all of the slipstream. You want to be able to break away as the field runs their way now off of the hairpin. So through now towards turn seven. Quick right-hander and then a very quick left as well. Very tricky section of racetrack right here. A lot of bumps, a lot of it, it. It's not quite off camber, but it definitely doesn't help you. It's very easy to lose that car through that sector. As you see, Ollie Peacock may be suffering some technical issues. Let's hope not. Let's hope for the best. down now through Bishop for these guys. This is going to be one of the quickest corners on the racetrack, that little right left. We'll ride on board with some, some of these cars at some point through there as we're reaching the one third point of this race. Down the back straightaway once again. You still see that one car, Vegas Waddell, trying to break the draft and you see everyone else doing so as well. Left and right and left and right just trying to defend their position. You see things getting a little bit dicier in the background of that I believe is the eight car leading that train of on Medina David Jarvis in this fight as well but it's the six of Everett Pete Paddock that you see fighting with the eight car through turn 17 and down the front straightaway this group's gonna go very very aggressive uh, bunch of cars we have here you see things getting mixed up back here as well as everyone's gonna cross the stripe they're all gonna stay single file though so nothing really going in towards turn one, maybe a little side by side. No, just people taking slightly different lines through that first corner. The two gets way off the racetrack through turn one. The 17 up the inside of the 22 of Craig Ridley. That was Finn Kenzo Kardinke. Not quite able to make that move stick though, as we're gonna look back out towards the front. And man, what a lap it was for Angus Waddell. Stretches out another half second of the nine car. Max Bartolotta is gonna slot himself into the second spot. And that might be exactly why that gap's been able to open up because these drivers in this second group of cars have not laid off one another whatsoever. They just want that, they want to get as high a position as they can, as early as possible. They're side by side again. Max is gonna defend that attack back from Ollie Peacock. 
And one has to wonder, do they need to play a little bit nicer with each other? Because they're losing so much time to that driver out in front. I mean, if we just bring up the distance now, it was 1.9 seconds at the start of this lap. Angus Waddell has managed to pretty much double that, put it to three seconds as they work through Bishop. We'll try to, I think I'm gonna do the onboard on it next time through as they work on to this long back straightaway once again. The Knight of Max Bartolotta gonna to try to be defensive this time. You see the 15 of Ollie Peacock slotting into the slipstream, getting ever closer, ever closer. You see another car slotting up the inside the 11. Oh, the door gets shut on the 11. Things getting dicey in towards turn 17. Off the final corner or down the front straightaway, they're gonna go once again. You see them still fanning defensive in the background as well. It was hard to take her eyes off this fight. Up the inside goes Ola Peacock. He's gonna take that second spot away. Do turn number one, in the run towards turn two and three. The nine right back up the inside. Can they make it stick? No, they can't. A little bit of contact. That's gonna check up this whole group of cars. Where do that group of cars in the background go though, I wonder? I don't see any damage, so we should be. Oh, we got a car around though. Who is that? That's gonna be Julian Dune. What in the world happened here to the Australian New Zealand driver in the four? Right on board here with the 21. See what happened through this sector. You see through turn two and into towards turn three right here. Everything's okay. It's coming off four and five. You see a little bit of, of a loose moment for that driver in front of him. And then through turn five, just gets forced off onto the grass. Not much he can do, make contact with another driver. And that's pretty much gonna be race over for them. They end up pulling it off the racetrack. Didn't seem like a particularly hard hit, but it was sort of in that worst sector of the, uh, of really the worst part of the car to ever get contact. He's riding on board with Francisco Fiorini as we head through Bishop. This double left-hander is very quick, but it's this next kind of right-left that is so fast here at Sebring in these high downforce cars it's in excess of 100 miles an hour on the bumpy concrete surface, constantly using the curbs here. That's one of the trickier corners to ever get right. Now these guys are gonna work their way down this back straightaway, working lap six of 14. At the end of the next lap, it's gonna be half distance. You see the move getting thrown again. A Max Bartolotta on Ollie Peacock, who's taking that second spot back. You see the two teammates, though, of Max and Francisco, somewhat fanning out off that final corner. They're going to single file it up. A little bit of a side-by-side -side moment behind, though, between Francisco and I believe that's Flavio Saturino. Saturino's going to end up moving into that spot. And I actually take that back. Max is the second driver in line here of the two player zone. Teammates in big contact there from Max Bartolotta who tried to throw the move down the inside at turn number three. I think this may have been a little bit ill-advised and a little bit late. Let's see what happens. From on board, you see Max is gonna lose this second spot, excuse me, lose this position on the run in towards turn one. Gives a little bit of wheel input to get that car to rotate. You see that car in front, not quite hooked up. And on the run in towards turn five, Max fell blood in the water, and that was way too late. Not really sure what Max was thinking there. That uh, That's a very difficult place to make a pass, even when you're fully alongside someone, but whenever you're trying to come back from several car lengths back, it's almost impossible to make that move stick. So now, Francisco, he's lost the cover and the maybe comfort of a teammate in some ways, but he also doesn't have too many cars he's fighting with anymore. This second gaggle has really kind of died off. These guys are going to work their way in towards Bishop once again. You see Francesca tucked right underneath the rear wing of the UK and Ireland driver of Ollie Peacock. Through turn 16, and Francesco, he's not going to like that. He's a little bit wide through Le Mans there. And that's going to push him way wide as Ollie is going to do everything he can to kill this slit stream. As they work in towards turn 17, and Angus Waddell is going to come off that final corner, and he'll be seeing cross flags from the iRacing starter stand halfway distance in this race. Seven laps down, seven laps to go. Let's see if Francisco can maybe make a move on the rundown in towards turn one. You see him working the sit stream. I don't think he's going to be close enough. 
But let's see what he can do. We know his teammate was aggressive. Is he as aggressive as Max was? A little bit wide with Ollie. But actually, no. It's just very tight exit from Francisco there. I thought Ollie may have been making a little bit of a trip through the grass. He actually held that corner pretty much perfectly. And they're going to work through on towards Big Ben. We got a slow car in front. That is not, yeah, that is Scott McIntyre, who's already four laps down. So issues for that driver, and he's going to end up calling it a day. As we're going to check in with a couple of these fights a little bit deeper down the field. And then Kenville Gardetti and Craig Ridley are involved in this little battle. Nose to tail on the run down in towards the hairpin. Nothing going for Craig in here this time. See another three car scrap behind as well. Fabio Santorino and Medina, Edward Paddock. Oh, and you see the 16th car is so loose coming off the hairpin there. Another difficult on throttle application zone here at Sebring is right off the hairpin here. And you'll be able to see why on this replay. You're gonna be breaking very, very late. You turn in through that hairpin, and as you pick up the throttle, with a little bit of a bump and then you have the curb that runs off onto the grass on the left hand side track doing everything it can to kill your to kill your traction at any point that's going to see that 16 lose a couple spots and he gets some grass again coming out of tower gonna drop it back even more so you know what that's gonna lose in the slip stream i believe guys work the way through Le Mans and down the back straightaway once again it's gonna be six laps to go Ollie Peacock still doing a good job holding on to this second position he's done very well to move Francisco back a couple of spots here So through now, turn one, and on the run up towards turns number two and three, the 11 of Francisco Fiorina trying to bring him in. The 15, though, doing him some favors. Ollie Peacock a little wide through turn three, and that's going to bring that 11 car right back into the mix. You can see how much closer he is after that one little mistake here through Big Bend. Let's see, does Fiorini make the move down in towards the hairpin? He's going to smell blood in the water, hard on the brakes, up the inside. He's got the move done for now, but can Ollie Peacock fight back on the run off the hairpin? It seems to have a little bit more momentum. Gonna work side by side here through this quick little right left chicane. That'll set him up on the outside here of this next corner and in this braking zone. Gonna be hard on the brakes, but no, he's not gonna try to slot it around the outside of the 11. Very late on the brakes there. That's gonna hurt his run down through tower. You can slot a move here in the tower corner if you're brave, but Ollie not gonna do so very wisely, I think. So back in towards Bishop as they get themselves sorted out. This quick double left, easy flat out, and a Greyhound butts pretty much, and then a quick dab of the brakes as you run into this right left. We've seen Francisco struggle a little bit in the dirty air. And he's a little bit wide again, runs a little bit wide on the curve. This is gonna help Ollie out. Just a little bit working his way down this back straight. You see the weaving going, trying to break the slipstream any way you can. As they work now in towards the final sequence of corners, well, the final corner, I should say. And they're going to get the five to go signal. They come off turn 17 a little bit wide with Francisco, and that's going to help Ollie Peacock just a little bit. Side by side across start finish. Francisco will hold on to the second spot that lap, though. As in towards turn one, actually Francisco does a beautiful job holding on to that position. We're just looking back at, in the field a little bit. See Ann Medina, a little bit of damage on that eight car, currently tucked under the wing as Flavio Satterino, Michael Stanley, who else is in this little gaggle of four or five cars? Martello Caruso, Aiden Gober, Marcin Andula, I believe in this as well. Four or five cars all kind of lined up here in the final five laps. Not really close, they're just close enough to really be having a fight, but not so close that they're throwing moves at one another. Let's just check back in with Ollie and Francisco. This is really the exciting fight on the racetrack. These guys have been swapping positions back and forth, back and forth, all race long. And they're gonna work their way through this corner and up towards tower once again. It's a 
down now in towards Bishop. Bishop, I believe, is technically this double left, but I also kind of consider this right left part of it as well. I don't actually know if this section of the racetrack technically has a name. I do that know that turn 16 is called Le Mans. And Francisco did a better job getting the run off that time. Ollie's still going to have the advantage of the slipstream, and Francisco is still trying to break the draft any way that he can. And as they work into the final corner, we see a couple cars really close to each other here in the background. This is 17 and the 22. Craig Ridley and Vincenzo Cardecci, or Carchetti, excuse me, is in towards turn 17. Was expecting Vincenzo to reel him in just a little bit more. But didn't really happen. Craig, though, a little bit wide in that Benetton theme skin. This might give that 17 car just the opportunity in towards turn one, working the draft, working the draft. No, not quite close enough. And of course, that's gonna be one of the big things. We haven't really talked about anything in terms of what kind of setups these guys might be running, difference in aerodynamic trims. You do have quite a bit of aerodynamic uh, adjustments available to you in this Pro Mazda, Star Mazda, whatever you happen to call it, Formula Mazda. It's all the 22 really, really wide, going all over those sausage curves. And that might open the door for Vincenzo in towards the hairpin. Craig's gonna defend the inside. Vincenzo's gonna try to slot it around the outside, but isn't gonna try too hard. Kind of knowing that it's really difficult to make a move along the, the long way around at that corner, but have a lot of downforce available to you in these cars in the garage as the 17 might actually try to set it up down the inside. No, not gonna happen as it works through turn 10. And in towards turn 11 now at Collier. What is sort of one of the difficult things, especially in these formula cars here at Sebring, is how you set them up. Because with the concrete surface and all the bumps, you really do want to load the car up with aero. But especially in these cars that are a little bit underpowered, it's so difficult to get the speed down the straightaways here. So it's always a bit of give and take, trying to make things happen, trying to make things work as best you can, trying to maintain speed through the corners while balancing that out with good speed down the straightaways. Let's check back in with this second place fight. Things are heating back up as Ollie Peacock has gotten to the rear of Francisco Fiorini. Three laps to go in this race, and I think we're pretty much gonna focus on these two as Ollie's gonna check on the right-hand side in towards turn one. You can make moves along the outside at turn one, and Francisco's gonna take things tight. This is the situation Ollie needs. He might be able to make this stick the long way around at turn one, and Ollie Peacock picks that second spot up through turn number one with only three laps to go. Let's get a replay of that move up on your screens. And let's rewind the cameras a little bit further, shall we, as they well, we will start it through the final corner. And he's watch Ollie as he runs down this front straightaway. Whenever you want to make a move going into turn one here on the outside, what you need to have happen is exactly what all he had, which is half the person he's fighting with run a very, very tight line into turn one, because then you pretty much get the advantage by making this corner such a wide radius, you can, you can just carry so much speed. You see what it is, what it looks like on board with Francisco this time. You can eventually see that sort of pale blue car nose down on the right-hand side. You just watch how tightly Francisco tries to hold it, just wait for that teal car eventually just swoop around the outside pretty much at the point of the exit and there he is you can see how far that he's clear by the time they get to that point on the racetrack as they work through Bishop with just a couple of laps remaining in this race of course Angus Waddell 6.1 seconds ahead of this duo no way these two are going to reel him in no matter how hard they try as they work their way down the back straightaway, it'll be two laps to go at the iRacing starter stand. You see Ollie not nearly as, let's say, brave and not nearly as gung-ho about defending the position. He's going to let Francisco slot through into that second spot. Could be a situation that Ollie likes to slip stream. Francisco, though, way wide through that final corner, caught one of those bumps in a way that looked like the car did not really appreciate. So Ollie's going to take the second spot right back in towards turn one, Francesco is going to try making the move up the inside at turn number one, but Ollie's going to hold fast on that outside groove. As 
two th through the turn three, four, and five section. Once again, the 11 car, all sorts of sideways. That was well held by Francisco. Replay of that coming up on your screen. That is a very difficult part of the racetrack to get sideways and be able to hold it. How much time did he leave though? You see the left-hander here and right, and then something happens right here. I think just a little bit too much trail break. You see him pump all that wheel and put into that wheel and just able to hold on to that is Francisco, and he has lost a considerable amount of time to Ollie Peacock. Harley Lewis behind may have seen that and might be saying, hey, maybe I can just get myself there. But I think he's a little bit too far back as well. We're gonna look back a little bit further. Craig Ridley and Everett Paddock, they've been going at it back and forth here. We've checked in with these guys a couple of times. And they're gonna work them their way through Collier and now in towards Tower, the six from TNT Racing. Trying to get up to Craig Ridley. Craig, not a very good run through Tower, so maybe an opportunity through for Everett, through Bishop. You don't typically see passing opportunities here, but Everett's gonna go for it, and he's got the position done on the run in towards Bishop. Very good move there by Everett Paddock. And now Craig is gonna try to fight back through Lamont. The six is very wide off that final corner as your race leader of Angus Waddell. He's gonna be taking the white flag here down to the start finish straight at Sebring. As we're gonna check back in with this fight side by side, they're two by two pretty much. As Craig Ridley gonna try the outside through this final corner, coming to the white flag for them. So the 22 and the six really giving it their all here still side by side not sure who's gonna actually have the position there it's gonna be craig ridley by about six thousandths of a second it's also flavio saturino and kenzo cardecci in the fight behind as these guys work their way through the first corner and up now towards three four and five for the final time you see him getting themselves single file can't really fight side by side through that sector on the racetrack down through Big Ben. This is going to be the first opportunity for Everett Paddock to maybe be able to make a move. On the run in towards the hairpin, you see kind of looking up the inside, but no, no move there just yet. Might have to happen down at the end of this segment of straightaway at Collier at turn, the turn 10 and 11 sector of the racetrack. Everett Paddock trying to make something happen. Gonna look up the inside, but no, nothing going there either. These this quad, quartet of cars will stay single file through turns 10 and 11. Through tower, let's see, does Everett Paddock get brave and slot up the inside here? No, still harassing the mirrors though of Craig Ridley as they work off tower and on the run in towards Bishop. And now there's really only about one and a half opportunities left. He's gonna try it on the inside though here at Bishop. The sixth car, no, not gonna be able to get that set up just yet. These guys are gonna come off this final corner as Angus Waddell, is, well, excuse me, they're gonna penultimate corner as Angus Waddell. He's gonna come off the final corner and win, but we're gonna check back in with this fight. They're midway down on the run in towards turn 17. The six car of Everett Paddock is gonna look up the inside. The 16 of Flavio is gonna make it three wide as they work through the final corner. Craig Ridley is gonna try the middle. Two cars, so loose, so wide. One of them finds the wall, it's gonna be I believe that's Everett Paddock who ends up stealing the position there as well as uh, uh, Cardecci who ends up slotting his way in as well. Replay coming up of this to figure out what in the world just happened through this final sequence of corners. Let's not ride on board with Craig Wrigley. I think this is just these guys throwing these cars way too hard into the corner here. So you're gonna see he's in the middle of the racetrack, not typically where you wanna be, and just carrying way too much speed with Craig Ridley. Did a good job to somehow keep it off the wall. Car behind was not nearly so lucky. That was Flavio. You can see that car pretty much busted. And he was tucked right underneath the rear wing of Everett Paddock. You're gonna see him slotted around the outside and just way too much speed. He gets a little bit loose there. And as Craig just barely misses that wall, Flavio pretty much center punches it. So with that, let's go down your post-race results and close out the show.
the end of 14 laps. It's Angus Waddell, who's the big winner with Ollie Peacock in the second spot. Francisco Fioroni in third, Harley Lewis in fourth, and Max Bortolota rounding out your top five. Everett Paddock is in sixth. Vincenzo Carashady, I believe is how that's going to be pronounced, is going to be my final interpretation of that. In seventh, Craig Ridley in eighth. Michael Stanley in ninth. And Marcelo Caruso rounds out your top ten. We look through Flavio Satorino in the 11th spot. Hayden Gober in 12th. Marcin Andula in 13th. Andre Fini 14th. And Anne Medima rounds out your top 15. Dane Snezik, Martin Arnoldis, Carl Crowley, Sven Schubert, and David Jarvis rounds out your top 20. You can only see 16 of those cars on the lead lap. Everyone else got themselves into some major trouble and ended up lap down. And we finish this out. John Michael Noyon, Julian Dunn, David Dendelo, and Scott McIntyre round out your 24 car field here today. We're going to take a quick commercial break, see if we have anyone coming through for some interviews, and then we will be right back. Do not go away. Welcome back here, and we got some people joining us for some post-race coverage. And you know what? Let's just kick it off with the driver who finished in the fourth spot after picking up a number of positions. Harley Lewis comes away in the fourth position. Harley, talk me through your race here today at Sebring. You started deep in the field in 14th, picked up 10 spots to get yourself up in towards P number four. Uh, how was it trying to fight through the field at a very bumpy and tricky Sebring circuit? Uh, I'm going to chalk that up to a lot of luck, which is nice because uh, I've had my fair share of bad luck this season. Um, shout out Angus for that uh, commanding win. And I'm not sure what happened up front, but definitely something happened. I saw he had an eight-second gap at one point. I'll have to go back and check it out. There are definitely a couple small incidents as well as just a lot of good hard racing happening sort of in that second group of cars that Angus was able to casually walk his way clear uh, clear from. But, you know, talking about these cars here at Sebring, I've, I know I've done some IndyCar races here in some leagues, uh, and I know how difficult it is just trying to set that car up around this place and with aerodynamic balance and trim. How, what sort of aero balance are you guys kind of looking for in these star Mazdas here at Sebring? I imagine you want the car really trimmed out because of the straights, but then you have, like, the sectors like Turn 1 and, of course, Bishop and, of course, that final corner where – Arrow really makes a huge, huge difference. And even turn 16, that 14, 15, 16 section, a lot of arrow really can help through there. How, what, how do you guys sort of approach the arrow balance here in these little Formula Mazdas? Well, I guess it really depends on the driver. I mean, the typical public setups that get thrown around, like the VRS one's a little bit loose. It's kind of more on my end. I like the back end to be pretty tail happy so I can get the, the front end to sit in. Um, the last two tracks, though, they're so bumpy, I mean... You have a lot of uh, force feedback on the direct drive wheel. It, it sure uh, is hard to catch it once it starts to to clip. As for the aero balance, nah, just slap a bunch of wing on and hope for the best. And now as we move forward, talking about aero balance, there's one more track coming after this one for you guys in this season, and that's going to be uh, Monza. Of course, that's going to be, uh, let's be honest, there's no aero balance there. You're basically going to be taking the wings off and hoping that thing can stay stuck to the ground. Oh, that's the Grazi Ragazzi lottery? Yeah. Basically, it just turns into a lottery because, you know, going into turn it's one. It's Daytona for Pro Mazdas. At least there's a pit stop to like kind of spread everything out, but you know, people get pretty brave, and then a lot of people lose it out of Ascari. 
Parabolica. The track doesn't look very difficult, but it really is. Yeah, I can definitely imagine so, especially with all the arrow you guys are going to be taking off the car. Then, especially with a pit stop added in, that's going to make things interesting as well. Well, thanks for joining us, Harley. Congrats on running your way through the field here. We didn't actually see as much as you because of the way of the way things were panning out in that battle for second, third, and fourth all race long. But regardless, did very well to move your way up 10 spots. Before we let you go, who gets it done for you guys? Oh, Angus and David are getting it done. Whatever car they drive, they're super fast. And uh, I think Angus is going to get the championship this year, uh, I guess this season, hopefully. And then uh, we'll see if David even bothers to do the whole season. Well, Anyways, thanks a lot, guys. Well, there he was. Mr. Harley Lewis comes away in the fourth spot. Strong top five positioning from him. Other driver we have here for some post-race coverage in 12th place. Hayden Gober is standing by with us. Hayden, didn't have the qualifying you would have liked. I believe you were technically the last car classified in qualifying. Indeed, you were. But you end up with this pretty decent 12th place finish considering where you started. Talk me through your race. Yeah, that's a typical race for me, I guess. Uh, I don't usually spin it uh, on my second hot lap. But, yeah, I just didn't quite have the pace. But, yeah, I had to drive around a lot of wrecks. So, and as well as stay in a draft train and hold my own so it wasn't easy and now we were just talking with uh, mr lewis just a moment ago about the race coming up next week monza it's going to be an interesting race for sure due to all the drafting uh how good are you at lotteries do you feel you have good enough luck to maybe have a good week next week i quite enjoy the uh the draft tracks that involve a pit stop um i feel like i I have a little bit of an advantage with the pit stop with all the endurance racing I do. I really practice my pit ins and pit outs, and uh, yeah, I, en I enjoy the draft game. It's fun. And then looking forward in toward this next season coming up as we round out, is this season three? Is this season three, right? Yes, it is. Um, I, it, it always gets weird near the end of the year because season, you know, I remember they reset their calendar a while back. Is that three and four, well, four pretty much ended at the end of the year, and it's been a while since it's been like that. It's sort of fallen out of cycle, so my uh, my potato brain is easily confused. But going in towards, you know, this build release coming up, for you guys that run these cars, of course, the big thing that's coming out is going to be that Formula 3 car. And while there is a bit of pace difference between the likes of it, the Formula Renault, and the Pro Mazda, uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion within the groups that run these cars about what they see is going to happen. Where do you see yourself falling in going in towards next year? Are you going to keep with this little uh, rotary engine thing, or you see yourself maybe going towards the new Delara that's coming in or going to the Renault? What's, what do you think? Uh, what are you going to do, and what do you think the uh, the ecosystem for these little feeder series uh, formula cars is going to look like? Well, I'm definitely a, a diehard Dorito fan. Um, love the little rotaries. They the The way this car handles is just really special. Uh, I think it's people, you look at this in the Formula Renault and you think it would be similar, but they're entirely different if you drive them. Uh, obviously, I'm going to buy the F2 car and, or the, sorry, the F3 car and see how, see how it goes and see how I like it. Um, I've heard it's a, it's a good fun car, but yeah, I'll probably, I'll, I, I really, I've kind of fallen in love with this, uh, this car and this group of guys. So it's kind of, kind of hard to leave. Well, I can definitely understand that. I've definitely, it's something I'd know very all too well about just getting into uh more the community rather than the actual car itself and even then if you can end up getting in, in love with the car then it's sort of a a dream come true but thanks for joining us hayden congratulations on a good run here today and recovering after a bit of a disaster and qualifying who gets it done for you in that number 12 i'm sorry could you repeat that you just kind of cut out at the end i said who gets it done for you in that number 12 any sponsors any friends any any religious affiliation Oh yeah. Uh, shout out to my, my team. We're kind of a little more of an endurance based team, but you see my livery there, action sim sport. So you can catch us in uh VLN and the special events next year. And uh, yeah, just looking forward to next season and all the stuff they got coming up for us. And thanks to everything you do, Randy. Appreciate it. Well, we're more than welcome to have you and thank you for the thanks here. I don't get nearly enough of it. Hugo pretty much beats us all, but uh uh, good luck to you with the, uh, well, first the lottery next week at Monza and then going in towards next season and figuring out where you're going to cycle in in the open wheel stuff and in all the endurance stuff as well. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, the season, man. We will definitely try to do so as there is only yeah. about a week left 
of this season. That is going to wrap it up here for this broadcast on Race Spot TV. I believe it is the last Pro Mazda broadcast we have of this season. I'm not actually sure if we have anything planned coming up in the next couple weeks. I know they'll sometimes do Week 13 events, but... Hugo's been running around because him and all of his selfishness had to go and get married. So uh, everything's a little bit uh, uh, by the seat of the pants at the moment at race spot. Um, but I will say that for those of you who maybe like to do a little bit of oval racing, we have something from here. At, we have something here at race spot cooking up for you guys. Uh, probably coming at you in the first couple weeks of January, maybe the last week of January. The schedule itself hasn't been sorted out just yet. But there's something in the pipelines here at Race Spot cooking uh, if you're into a li little bit of oval action. That's all I am going to say. I do have to thank everyone who works with us here at Race Spot. For, of course, Istvan Ballo at Track Cams 22. Andy Werner for the beautiful overlays that I get to click the buttons and generate on screen. Of course, it was Simon Grossman who coded up the actual overlay software to make that actually work. And Nick Tiston for the live timing that we tend to use for our bigger events. But thank you everyone for tuning in. We will see you all next time.